Good morning. I'm so glad you've joined us here. We're going to be beginning our service in just a few short minutes, but before we do, we wanted to take a moment and recognize and make a special announcement to say thank you and God bless you to mothers. If you're a mother and you're out there, we are so thankful for you. We're so glad you've joined us. And you know, the Bible exalts and honors mothers. And in fact, it tells us to honor our mothers. And we want to do just that. I hope you'll take this special time today to honor your mother. Well, if you're a mother and you've joined us, uh, would you go ahead and drop a comment in the comment box letting us know something about you and your motherhood? Maybe you've been a mother for 50 years already. Maybe you're an expecting mother. Maybe you've been a mother to 20 children. Maybe you're a mother of foster children. Who knows? Whatever it may be, we'd like to know. So let us know. Drop a comment on there, and we'd love to know something about your motherhood. We are thankful for you, and boy, do we honor you. Well, I'd like to read you a poem as well. It's called A Mother's Love. It says here, there's no love like a mother's. Her heart is filled with care. With Christ, as her example, her Savior's love she'll share. A mother's love is endless, not changing for all time. When needed by her children, a mother's love will shine. God bless those special mothers. God bless them, every one, for all their tears and heartaches and special work they've done. And we want to say just that. God bless you to all the mothers out there. Hope you'll stay tuned and enjoy the service coming up in just a minute. Well, good morning, Beacon family, and our friends have been keeping up with us on Facebook. Sure is good to see you this morning, even though I don't see you, but I want to give you some great news. Guess what? We will be meeting in the church here, Beacon Baptist Church on Aurora Road, May 17th, Sunday, May 17th at 1030 in the morning. We'll give you a little bit more information at the end of the service on that, so stay tuned and listen, but I'm going to tell you something. It is good to know that things are turning around and we're coming back to some normalcy uh, in our land. Our governor and our president has opened up the country and the state somewhat. And so it's time that we get together as a family and begin to worship and praise the Lord for the Savior that he is. Now this morning, if you're out there with us, we want you to join. If you've got friends, go ahead and on that friends list and share this with them real quick so they can get tuned in. I pray that you've uh, got yourself ready, you've got your Bible and your notepad ready to take notes because I know Pastor Gwen has a tremendous message for us this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to meet with us as we start our service. Father in heaven, once again, what a great privilege it is to call upon you. And Lord Jesus, as you take us to our Father this morning, we pray that you would just be in the midst of these services, Lord God. I pray, Father, for a special anointing upon the scene. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be with Pastor Gwen and that as he opens your word and preaches to us this morning, that the Holy Spirit would just uh, take it and use it within our lives. Father, I also pray for that one or two that may be listening this morning that don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, would you just draw them to the cross of Calvary? And Lord, today we just give you the honor and the glory. Thank you for the privilege to, to even be able to come and to I have this service, even though we're not able to be together in your house as a family. Well, what a great privilege it is to be able to worship you today. Just be with us now, and we ask in your precious and loving name, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. I don't know about you, but you have peace in your heart. Do you have peace in your soul this morning? Let's stand. Let's sing. I've got that peace like a river. I've got love like an ocean in my 
Beaconbaptistfamily.com and you can give online there in the top left hand corner of our website it says give now you can choose which fund you want to designate it to uh, but make sure that's where you go if you're going to give online and if you'd like to send in your tithe for the last time you can do that to Beacon Baptist Church and it's P.O. Box 360-851 Melbourne 32936 that information is on the website as well if you need to see that at a later time but take your time and go ahead and do that at some point during the service or after. Uh, make sure you don't forget it. Don't skip out on the Lord. Well, we also want to read our scripture reading in preparation for the message. So I hope you brought your Bible today. Take out your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 2. The book of Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 11. And there it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven, now when this was noised abroad, and the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Verse 11 says, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. What an amazing thing that was going on here at Pentecost, and I'm so excited to hear Pastor Wayne preach about this, and so we can learn more about the, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and what the Bible says about it. I hope you're looking forward to it. But join us for one more song as we sing, Shine, Jesus, Shine. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land. Spirit, 
and emphasize the fact that the Holy Spirit is God. He's part of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They have distinct uh, responsibilities and personality, but they're three in one. I don't understand all of that, but that, that's what the Bible teaches us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is God. Not only is he God, he's a person, not a power, not a force, not an influence. He's a person that when we're saved in the day of grace, takes up his residence within our heart. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. Today, I want to continue that series by talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. Listen to this prophecy given to us by Joel, chapter number two and verse number 28. Joel chapter two, verse number 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens, in those days will I pour out my spirit. A prophecy by Joel. Listen now to Peter's address at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 16. Peter basically quotes the prophet Joel when he says, but this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. This is that. This is what Joel was talking about, Peter is saying here. And he goes on to say, And it shall come to pass in those days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Here Peter is quoting the prophet Joel. Joel is telling us that there's coming a day in the last days. The day of the Lord is what Joel is talking about. And Peter says, and this is that. This is the last day. Our Lord is soon to come back again. He promised he's coming back. This is those days. And God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon you. The prophecies that we read in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, uh, tells us that in these days, God has spoken to us by his Son through the Spirit. Uh, that's the day of grace. It's a whole different day than what it was in the Old Testament. Maybe if I uh, talk about dispensations, you will really catch the drift of where I'm going with this. It, this the Bible begins with the dispensation of the Father. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1. In the beginning, God created those days of creation, when all that we know came into existence, that dispensation of God the Father in his creative acts. Then the Bible talks about the dispensation of the Son, beginning there uh, in, in the book of Genesis as well, where God promises to send a Redeemer, uh, to save a lost and dying world. And then all through the Old Testament, we can follow uh, the events leading to the birth of the Son. He was promised through the line of Seth, and then it goes on through Noah, and goes on uh, through Abraham, and goes on through Isaac, and it goes on, or Jacob, and it goes on through Judah and then even down to David. And the Bible lays out that story 
of the coming of the Lord. And it, it talks about his birth and his life and his death, his resurrection and his ascension. It's the dispensation of the Son of God, our Redeemer. He's bringing our redemption to us. He's going to be the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. And thirdly, the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. That's the day and hour in which we're alive. There's going to be an outpouring, Jesus said, of the Holy Spirit of God. And we read about that in Acts chapter 2. Brother Caleb read our text today, and it talks about Pentecost and the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Joel says there's going to be a greater day coming, a glorious day coming. You know, the amazing thing about God is that it always, things always get better with God. Always get better, more upward and onward and forward and better and more glorious with God. He started with creation and uh, followed by redemption. And redemption is followed by sanctification where the Holy Spirit of God works in us and conforms us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it goes from there into glorification. That day when we're caught up together with the Lord in the air and we become just like Jesus, we have a glorified body. And it just gets better and better and better with God. And so we're living in that dispensation of the Holy Spirit, the dispensation of grace. And it's always better and better with God. And let me, let me hasten to say, God's purposes are sovereign. They're sovereign. Nothing is going to change them. Nothing can thwart them. Convulsions of nations, they, they rise and fall. The upheaval uh, of social order, it, it doesn't matter what's going on uh, socially in, in our world and in our country and in our neighborhood. That's not going to thwart the plan of God devastation of war. There have been war after war after war, and yet God's plan continues to be fulfilled, just as God intended it to be fulfilled. And may I hasten to say, not even the ravage of disease can destroy uh, the sovereignty of God and thwart the plan of God, because he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. You're taking notes. My first thought about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is this. There was a set time, a set day. Uh, God had a plan. He knew exactly when it was going to take place. I'll get into that a little bit later here uh, as I talk about the Feast of the Jews because the Jews are God's calendar and those all of those feasts, those seven feasts are on the calendar of God and they basically fit the plan of God. Passover, well, we'll get into that here in just a moment. But there was a set date uh, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. There was a set time uh, for the incarnation, the birth of the Savior, God coming in the flesh. Not only was there a set time, but there was a set way. The book of Isaiah chapter 7 tells us, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. There was a set way through the, uh, the womb of a virgin that Christ was coming into this world. Not only was there a set way, but there was a set place. Micah would tell us in his prophecy that it would be Bethlehem of Judea where the Savior would be born. We know all about that because of all the Christmas carols we sing. 
O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. But there was a set time, a set way, a set uh, place, uh, and the Holy Spirit was uh, had a set time in which he was going to be poured out upon the earth. The crucifixion was on a set day because Jesus was our Passover lamb. It had to be at Passover time. That's when the lamb was slain. And so it was the 14th day of the first month. And in the Jewish calendar, the first month was April. April. And so the 14th day of the first month was Passover. And it was at Passover. If you remember, Jesus was crucified and they took him down because it was the Passover. The next day, it was a set time, a set day. The resurrection was a set day. The third day after uh, the crucifixion, it was a set day. And there's a day set for his second coming. We don't know the hour. We don't know the day. Jesus said it's, he doesn't know that, but God the Father knows what day that is. And one of these days, the trumpet's going to sound, and uh, we're going to hear the shout of the angel come up hither, and the dead in Christ are going to rise. We're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds, and what a day that's going to be. That's a set day that's coming in the future. And the day is set for the outpouring of his spirit. And we read about that in Acts chapter 2. We call it the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th, 50th. And uh, it's a day, really, is a day in type. As I pointed out a while ago, it refers back to those Old Testament feasts. They had the feast of Passover. That was first. Uh, it goes back to when they were freed from the land of Egypt on that Passover night. And they observed that every year after that on the 14th day of the first month. Seven days later, uh, they had the Feast of First Fruits. <clears throat> now the Feast of Passover uh, talks about the sacrificial lamb. If you remember, John the Baptist is the one that pointed at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. He's our Passover Lamb, the perfect Lamb of God that would take away our sin. And then uh, 17, or seven days later, they had uh, the Feast of First Fruit, which refers to his resurrection. It's a picture of the resurrection. And then 49 days later, actually 50 days, it's 49 days, seven weeks, and then pa uh, Pentecost, the 50th day. And so uh, there was a set day, and it points to God's plan. If you remember, after the resurrection, Jesus ascended at, back into heaven. After showing himself alive, the Bible says, by many infallible proofs, uh, for 40 uh, days, he showed himself. He was here, and then he was there, and he was in the upper room, and down by the seashore, uh, on the road to Emmaus, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was, he was showing himself that he was alive uh, to those uh, apostles and those early Christians. And for 40 days, uh, he was doing that. Then he ascended back into heaven. You remember that scene as he jumps on a cloud and walks on the wind and goes back to the right hand of the Father. The Bible says that for 10 days they met in that upper room in prayer. Can you imagine a 10-day prayer meeting? Most of us struggle with a five-minute prayer. For 10 days, they met, the Bible says, in one accord. 
They were all in agreement. And they were praying, pouring their heart out to God for 10 days. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Lord appears and the Holy Spirit is given uh, to them on that day of Pentecost. Do you remember the promise of Jesus in John chapter 14? He said, I will pray the Father. He'll give you another comforter that he may ab abide with you forever. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The promise of Jesus for the sending of the Holy Spirit. It is the promise of God. In fact, when Jesus ascended, just before he ascended, while he was on the mountaintop with the disciples talking with them, he said, wait here in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. Wait till the promise comes. And the Holy Spirit is that promise of God poured out on the day of Pentecost. And when the Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, the Lord took up a new residence, a new dwelling place, a new tabernacle, not in the temple, not in a building of stone, but in our heart. He moves in when we trust Christ. Paul would write to the church at Corinth and say, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. God in us, living in us. If God has a voice, it's our voice. If God has hands, it's our hand. If God has feet, it's our feet. We're the temple of God. And what a privilege to be the vessel that God would use to spread the good news of the gospel as the Holy Spirit of God works within us and speaks out through us. What a marvelous thing it is when God's people gather in his house. And aren't you excited about the fact that next Sunday we can get back in the house of God? Uh, May 17th, uh, we're going to open our doors and uh, invite you back to come as a congregation uh, we'll have all kinds of stipulations. Buddy will go with, go over with you here in a, in a little bit. But we're going to meet again in the house of God, uh, where the people of God, with the spirit of God, and the music of God, and the preaching of God takes place, and the Holy Spirit can work in our hearts and move our spirits if we don't hinder the Holy Spirit. If we don't quench the Holy Spirit, he can be felt, felt and move in our services. He can be felt when the praise team and the choir sing. He can be felt when the musicians play. He can be felt when the preacher stands behind the sacred desk and opens the word of God and begins to preach with the anointing of the spirit of God, you can sense the spirit of God speaking to your heart when we gather in his house. When the invitation is given, the tugging of the Holy Spirit of God on your soul. This is for you. This is what I want. Come. Surrender, get right, rejoice, be right, do right, go out and witness the moving of the Spirit of God in our hearts. May I say as well, there's a universality 
of the gift of the Spirit. Peter said in verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days that God said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see vision. Old men will dream dreams. On my servants and on my handmaid, I will pour out my spirit. They'll prophesy in that day. What a marvelous thing that is. What a joy to be a vessel of God, to bring the good news of the gospel to everyone. God has entrusted that to every one of us who have been saved because he takes up his residence in us and he gives us the power to witness and to share that good news. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would come and go. And it was only on a select few people that the Spirit of God came on as you read the Old Testament. Uh, guys like Samson, the Bible talks in the book of Judges about how the Spirit of God came on Samson. On Samuel, the Spirit of God spoke to Samuel and guided Samuel, and he would come and go and give Samuel uh, instruction. Saul, David, Solomon, Isaiah, on and on we could go through the Old Testament. The Spirit would come uh, for a, a time to an individual and give them what to say and what to do and what to prophesy. Uh, it was uh, the Spirit would just come and go. But here in this dispensation, God said, I want to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Think about that. On all flesh. That means you. That means me. If we're a born again child of God. God's going to pour his spirit out. He's going to take up his residence within us. And think about that. An inspired pulpit. An inspired pew. An inspired preacher. An inspired lay people. Coming together as the Holy Spirit ministers in our midst and in our heart in us and through us. And what a joy it is when we gather in a service where the Spirit of God takes over. And what a joy to see what happened when God takes over a service. I recall back several years ago, I was involved in music and uh, my preacher was a great preacher and he was invited to speak at a youth camp of uh, single adults. Actually, it was a winter retreat in the mountains of Colorado. And he called me on a Tuesday night and uh, said, I want you to drive up to the mountains of the camp called Horn Creek. And there was a large group of single adults there that he was ministering to. And he was saying, I... I've not had any breakthrough in this in this meeting uh, with these young people. I want you to come up and I want you to sing. And uh, when I arrived, he sat down at the piano. He had been my voice teacher in college and played the piano. He knew the songs that I knew and he sat down and began to play. And I just played whatever he began to, I, be, I sang whatever he began to play. And in the midst of all of that, the Holy Spirit came into that place and began to speak to the hearts of those kids. And one by one, two by two, they began to just get up from their seats and go find a place and fall on their knees 
and cry out to God. That's a work of the Spirit of God. And what a joy when you come into a service and the Spirit of God grips the hearts of people. And he's going to pour out his Spirit on all flesh, on the young, the old, the male, the female, the boy, the girl, all flesh. It says, when I pour out my spirit, they'll begin to prophesy. Your sons and daughters will begin to prophesy. And when I, when I say prophesy, most folk I know, when they hear the word prophecy, thinks of someone that foretells what's going to happen in the future. But if you study the Greek and look up the Greek word, the primary meaning, uh, foretelling the future, is the secondary meaning of that word. The primary meaning is to foretell to forth, to not foretell, to forth tell the message of God, the message of the Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came to live within us, the purpose, Christian, listen to me, the purpose is that we might share the gospel. Preacher, I don't know what to say. Just begin to tell them how you got saved. And you'll be amazed at what God will bring to your mind and what liberty God will give you to speak as you share your testimony inspired by the Holy Spirit because it happened in you and to you. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel, to witness for the Lord. That's God's plan. He says, old men will dream dreams. Now you can tell by looking that I've been around a little while. Uh, but like Victor Hugo said, it may be winter on the top, but it's spring in my heart. You can get wrinkles in your face but you don't have to get a wrinkle in your soul you can still be excited about the things of God and the work of God and your testimony for the Lord and the fact that you're on your way to a wonderful place called heaven you can rejoice about that you can be excited about that you can dream about that old men will dream dreams young men will see visions One of the sad things in the church today is not, not many young people are seeing a vision for God. I remember back in my early days of ministry when you would see people walk the aisle and say, Preacher, God's calling me to full-time work. I want to go to Bible college. I want to preach. I want to be a missionary. I want to give my life to to the music of God. I want to give my life working with young people. God's calling me. And they had visions. Young people had visions. I can remember as a young man uh, visions of, of what God could do in using me uh, with the gospel and what God could do in my life and what God could do with the youth group I had and what God could do with the choir that I led and then when I began to preach what God could do in the, in the preaching services that I had, young men see visions. And you know what? The greatest song is yet to be sung. The greatest poem is yet to be written. The best sermon is yet to be preached. The greatest Sunday school is yet to be built. The best church in the world 
is yet to be formed. Have that vision. Listen to the call of God. Let the Holy Spirit direct you and call you and give yourself to the work of God. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. And all of us can share the good news of the gospel and forth tell what Christ has done for you. When Peter stood up at Pentecost, he was going to be God's instrument to introduce this new dispensation, this day of grace, this day of the Holy Spirit of God to the world. Listen to what Jesus told Peter in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 18. Jesus said, I say unto, you, unto thee, that thou art Peter, and the Greek word is Petros, which means a little stone. You're just a little stone, Peter. And upon this rock, and the Greek word is Petra, which is foundation stone, not on a little stone like you, Peter, but on a foundation stone. What stone is that? The Lord Jesus Christ himself, the God of heaven. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee, listen now, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever shall be loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Gave him the keys of the kingdom. And in keeping with that promise, that promise to Simon Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when God had poured out his spirit upon those in the upper room, they flooded out into the streets of Jerusalem. And Peter began to preach to the Jews. And he, he began to share the good news of the gospel. And as a result, 3,000 of those Jews that day were born into the family of God and received the Holy Spirit. And if you jump over to Acts chapter number 8, Philip is down in Samaria. He's preaching. And remember, the Samaritans were half Jew and half Gentile. They were half-breeds. And Philip was sharing the good news of the gospel. And there were many that responded to that good news. But it was Peter that was sent by the apostles down to Samaria. And it was Peter that laid his hands on those Samaritans and they received the Holy Spirit. Peter said, this is okay. He re they received the Holy Spirit. It was in Acts chapter 10, just two chapters later. Cornelius, that, uh, that uh, general, that centurion, that uh, Gentile, that pagan, seeking God in his heart, a devout man, one that prayed, but he wasn't saved. And God would say down in verse 5, send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And you remember the whole story of the sheep that came down and 
that he did this, and Peter said, I can't eat, it's an unclean animal. God said, don't call anything unclean that I say is clean. Uh, and uh, you remember all that went through, and then Peter realized God was leading him back down to Caesarea, to Cornelius' house. And when he arrived, he began to share the good news of the gospel. And listen to verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, he was talking about the words of the gospel. The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of one a circumcision, which believed, were amazed. All of the Jews that were with Peter were amazed that these uncircumcised Gentiles could receive the Holy Spirit of God. And as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And in verse number 47, Peter turns and says, Can any man forbid uh, water that these should be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And the door of salvation and the gospel was opened to the Gentiles. Peter had the keys. It was presented to the Jews, to the half-Jews, and to the Gentiles. And God said, I want to pour out my spirit on all flesh. And if you'll turn your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and embrace him as your Lord and Savior, he'll come in and dwell in your heart. He'll pour out his spirit upon you. Now let me talk for just a minute about those external phenomenon that happened on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given. Back to our text, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Look at the phenomenon that happened. The Bible says he came as the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Notice it wasn't wind. There was no wind. It was the sound of wind. The breath of God breathe up on them. Marvel not, John would say in chapter 3, that I say unto you, ye must be born again. Then listen, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whether it comes and where it goes. That's the Spirit of God. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know where it goes. But God said, I'm going to send my Spirit. And he breathed on them. The breath of God. The breath of God. Then he said, it was like the Shekinah glory of God. The brightness of of God's presence came. And he said it was like cloven tongues of fire. In other words, when that light appeared, it began to divide. He said it sat upon each of them. The fire of God, the fire of the Holy Spirit of God, sat upon each of them. 
God didn't send a flaming sword like he did when he put Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden to keep them out of the garden. It wasn't a flaming sword. It was tongues of fire, flames of fire that rested upon them. The preacher, what's the significance of that? God never intends us to use coercion to get somebody to get saved. I can't twist anybody's arm. I can't make anybody get saved. I can't, uh, we can't take a, cord and go, a, a sword and go in and conquer a country and demand that they all become Christians. That's not God's plan. God's plan is that we as the children of God would use a tongue set on fire by the Holy Spirit of God in our heart that we would share with our friends, our loved ones, our families, our neighbors, and yea, even those around the world, what Christ has done for us, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. That's God's plan for the proclamation of the gospel. Spirit-filled Christian who will go out and share the good news, energized by the Holy Spirit of God. Thirdly, I would say, not only were they filled with the Spirit and those tongues of fire settled on them, but the Bible says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with other tongues. And I know there's been a lot of controversy about that in Christendom. But I think the Bible is pretty clear what he was talking about. Look at verse number four again. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when he was uh, when he was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, confused, because they uh, because every man heard them speak. Listen now, in his own language. So this gift of tongues was a miracle of God because as they spoke, everyone heard what they said in their own language. That miracle. They were all amazed verse 7, and marvel, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galilean? Aren't they speaking Galilean? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? And then he names all of those, the Parthians and the Medes and the Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Persia and Pamphylia and Egypt, parts of Libya and Crete uh, and uh, uh, those Jews and proselyte Crete and Arabian who do hear them speak in their, uh, in their uh, tongues the wonderful works of God as they preached as Peter preached, as they spoke, all of those disciples, people that heard them, heard their words in their own language, the miracle of Pentecost. But Pentecost was an event that only happened once.
Since Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, when we're saved, is immediately born into our hearts and our lives and fills us with the Holy Spirit. We get all of the Holy Spirit we're ever going to get the moment we trust Christ as our Savior. The question is, how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? He lives within us. But here's the thing about God. He will never force you against your will to do his will. The Holy Spirit will never force you to do anything you're not willing to do. But if you'll just do it, if God moves on your heart to share your testimony, if you'll share your testimony, it'll be energized by the Holy Spirit of God. That's how the Spirit works. When we yield to the Spirit of God, the power of God rests upon us. And the fourth, fourth phenomena I see in this passage is Peter himself. Just before the crucifixion, we see Peter around the fire, warming his hands at the fire. And when the little maiden says, you're one of his disciples, he cowers before her and curses and denies that he even knows the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here, just days later, having been filled with the Holy Spirit of God, Peter begins to preach on that day. And Peter begins to sound off and tell them uh, that it's uh, because you are the ones who've taken and with wicked hand crucified him. And in his sermon, he takes a bold stand for the Lord. And it's amazing. How God could take a blonde-headed, and I did have blonde hair at one time, blonde-headed, blue-eyed country boy from Indiana, afraid of his own shadow, and call him to stand behind the pulpit and preach the gospel. It's amazing that God would use somebody like me, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit of God. And what were the results? Well, in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 37. Now, when they had heard this, when they had heard Peter's sermon, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? This was the same crowd that 50 days ago were there around the cross crying for the crucifixion. Crucify him! Crucify him! They refused to hear Jesus himself. But when the Holy Spirit came and indwelt a vessel of God, and he began to preach the word of God in the power of the Spirit of God. They were pricked in their heart, and they cried out, What must we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent. Stop. Turn around. Change your ways. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The result was people trusted Christ. 3,000. Another chapter over, there were 5,000 and 4,000. And then they just quit counting and they, they just said multitudes of people. Josephus, the famous Jewish historian, tells us that in that first year of the Age of Grace, as the apostles were preaching and scattered uh, about, 
there were over 100,000 converts to Christianity because these were men filled, filled, and controlled, and given to the Holy Spirit of God. And God used them in a marvelous way. Verse 41 says, They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there was added unto the church some 3,000 souls. The outpouring of the Spirit of God on all flesh, upon you, if you're a child of God, upon me, that we might foretell what God has done for us because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, paying for our sin, dying for us, being buried, being resurrected on that third day, sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession, praying for us, and waiting for that day and God says, go get my children. And he brings us all home to glory. What a day that's going to be. Has the Spirit of God poured out on you? Have you trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Let me ask you, Christian. You've been filled with the Spirit when you got saved. But have you surrendered your life really to the Holy Spirit? the leadership of the Holy Spirit, to let him guide you and use you? Are you speaking out for him? Are you using your voice to sing and praise him? Are you using your time and energy to serve him? Are you using your resources to support the work of God? Are you surrendered to the Holy Spirit? If not, why not just make a new commitment to God, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Would you pray with me? If you're not saved, just ask him for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. Just say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Save me for your sake. Come into my heart. Fill me with your spirit. If you're a child of God, why don't you pray that little chorus? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. I trust you'll tune in next Sunday. And uh, if you're one of our members, I trust you'll be in your place in the house of God next Sunday. I want to preach a sermon on the baptism of the Holy Spirit next week. God bless you all. Have a great week walking with the Lord. Thank you again, Pastor Gwen. Great message. And I don't know about you, but I'm really excited. It's been an exciting Sunday, but next week, I just can't wait till we're together again as a family. We're going to put some of those precautions in. I call it Back to Church Sunday. Next Sunday morning, 1030, one service. Uh, we'll all be meeting in the auditorium. We will not have children's church. We'll be not, we'll not be running the band. Uh, and matter of fact, the mission will be uh, listening there at the mission uh, until we work these things out, maybe for a week or two. But we'll be practicing. We want everybody to be safe, and so we'll be taking all the precautions to be safe. We'll do, we'll do our social distancing. Uh, if you're uh, if, if you're with your family, you can sit with your family. You all that are living together, uh, we'll ask you not to do any handshaking and touching each other, things like that. Just look at everyone, smile real big, and tell them how much you love them and how much you miss them. 
And then, of course, we will not be passing the offering plate. But bring your tithes and offerings because we'll have a box set up in the back to, uh, so you can drop that in there. Then, of course, we'll be taking some precautions and spraying down the doors and things like that, keeping the upholstery uh, cleaned up and things like that. So you come. And I know that there's some of you right now, you're still a little bit uncomfortable by getting out in public. And, um, and, and then there's some of you that have some health issues that uh, just right now it might not be good for you to be out in public also. But I want to reassure you that we'll still be bringing our message uh, through Facebook. And next week will be a little bit different. We had to order some um, some equipment to do this because we've been setting up in the middle of the auditorium so we can uh, get the sound and everything well. And we'll not be able to do that with people moving around in, in the auditorium. So we're going to have to capture everything with, with the camera that we've ordered. And uh, hopefully the next week we'll have everything set up. So uh, you'll be able to watch our, our uh, service next Sunday. Uh, on Facebook, and we want you to join us if you can't be here, or on YouTube through our website, uh, but it may run just about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and a half later uh, than the live service. So you'll be getting updates during the week, you watch for them, listen to them. Man, it's been a great day to be to just be with the Lord, and I want to encourage you, let's go out, let's stay faithful, let's stay faithful to serving the Lord Jesus Christ, to serving others. And may the Lord just give you a blessed and a wonderful week. See you next Sunday, hopefully here. If not, catch us on Facebook. Lord bless you.